Okay, thank you everybody. Quite a lot of this, um, the thematic of this symposium is about um, the, uh, in, in a way, the tension between humanness and the desire for technological perfection. And this has been amply demonstrated in the past 10 to 15 minutes. So, thank you everybody for coming here. There's some of you present in person. There are, in fact, many others um, watching online. I'm Jackie Leach Scully. I'm Professor of Bioethics and Director of the Disability Innovation Institute at UNSW, and I'm welcoming you here today. And I'd like, first of all, to acknowledge the Bedigal people of the Eora Nation, who are the traditional custodians of the land uh, that UNSW's Kensington campus currently sits. I'd like to pay my respect to the elders, both past and present, and extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are present. Those joining us online may wish to acknowledge the lands they are on in the chat function. As we share our own knowledge and teaching and learning and research practices and histories across our universities, we also pay respect to the knowledge and history embedded within the Aboriginal custodianship of country. Just a word about the UNSW DIIU, the Disability Innovation Institute, for those of you not familiar with it. It is a World First initiative focusing on disability research, education, and knowledge exchange. And our team members take pride in undertaking work that is radically inclusive and that crosses disciplinary boundaries. Our approach is to see disability not as a problem to be solved, but as an integral part of the human condition to be encountered and engaged with rather than feared. And it's in this light that we are holding this symposium and the webinar series. So this is the first in a series of events entitled A Path Still Present. Perhaps there should be a question mark there, perhaps not. Disability discrimination and eugenics in, from the Nazi Third Reich to COVID-19. And the idea for this event series was prompted to me about a year ago after I first read um, The First Into the Dark, a book uh, co-written by Michael Robertson, who's speaking today, Astrid Lay, and Edwina Light, who's also with us today. But in fact, I first became truly conscious of the history of the Nazi onslaught against disabled people back in the early 2000s, when I was part-time living in Dresden, in Germany. A few miles up the road, or rather up the River Elbe, uh, is the town of Pirna. And Pirna is uh, an attractive little town to go to on a summer afternoon for an excursion. Pirna is also the site of Castle Sonnenstein, which from the early 19th century housed a psychiatric hospital, which in around 1940 was converted into a killing centre for people with disability. It's estimated that around 15,000 people with physical and mental disabilities were killed here before the end of the program. In 2000, the year 2000, a memorial to that suffering and that loss of life was established at Sonnenstein. As we'll hear in the rest of today's symposium and the following webinars, this was part of a much wider social, cultural and political stance towards people with disability prevalent throughout Europe and the rest of the world at that time. So the aim of this series of seminars is not simply to consider these as historical events that appear to us today so shocking, but also, also safely set back in, you know, in history uh, so that we can confidently say, you know, never again. We also want to consider whether this is a past still present or partially present, that is, whether these ideas still influence in some ways attitudes to people with disability, including in the form of a covert and sometimes overt reluctance to recognise their human rights. So I'm going to, at last, introduce our two speakers for today. And first of all is Dr. Darren O'Brien, who's Honorary Senior Research Fellow at the School of Historical and Philosophical Inquiry uh, University of Queensland and adjunct lecturer at the University of Sydney. He's also chair of the Australian Institute for Holocaust and Genocide Studies 
and director of the Australian Stumbling Stones Project. He's been researching and writing in Holocaust and comparative genocide studies for 30 years. And the title of his talk is uh, Measured, Segregated, Annihilated, Scientific Racism, Eugenics, and the Essence of the Omni Perfecto, from Paul Brocker to Karl Brandt, William Lunner to Susa Feuerstein. Darren. I'd also like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting, the Betagol, Gadigal and Naganawal people where you are located and the Kabi Kabi people where I'm located, as well as elders of each of these nations, past, present and emerging. I'd also um, just like to say that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, indeed everybody, should be aware that this talk contains images and descriptions of deceased persons in documents and photographs and contains historical language that is confronting and offensive by our standards today and remains so. Today I'm going to take on a very uh, quick survey, um, a blistering pace, I apologise for that, but I have lots of pictures and illustrations. We're going to look at photographs, documents and key points essentially, looking at the course of history as a historical survey. I don't endorse these views, this is these are the facts as best as we know them, um, and they're all always under um, uh, scrutiny. So I want to start back in the 18th century, um, and man has this predilection to um, dissect and scrutinise his natural environment. He always has, uh, but in this particular period, you probably remember from Year Nine and Ten biology, Carl Linnaeus's system of kingdoms, classes, orders, and genera, uh, genera and species. Um, he collected from the natural world over 14,000 plants, 3,000 insects, 1,500 shells. And we can always remember, I guess, as children attending natural history museums and looking at all the insects with pins stuck into them. And um, others looked at humans, especially. So the Germans, Johann Blumenbach, uh, physician anthropologist, professor of natural history, University of Göttingen. He collected 60 human skulls. And from these, he deduced that there were five, what he called, races of man. He matched skull, skull types with regional skin colour. And he named them the Caucasian, which stood for the white race, the Malayan, the brown race, the Ethiopian, the black race, the Mongolian, the yellow, and American, the red. And he comes up with the term cork. Caucasian variety because he found this skull that he thought represent the ideal from the foot of Mount Caucasus and you may know from your geography Caucasus Mountains just north of Armenia um, Azerbaijan in Georgia Samuel Morton an American was also interested in skulls but he amassed an enormous collection so these are all quite the highly educated upper tier of aristocracy of these countries at this period, wealthy. Uh, he collected over a thousand human skulls from all over the globe. Uh, ancient Egypt, he also included. And he determined that he believed that the intellectual capacity or ability of a race could be determined by the capacity of the skull. So you know, obviously, when you look at the brain, it's that grey, squashy matter. And how do you determine that there's intelligence from that? You can't. So the next thing they looked at was the casing of the brain. So Morton uses lead shot because he believes it's an ideal size and weighs and determines the cubic capacity. Then he looks for an, a natural, apparently mustard seed is very consistent. And he uses mustard seed in order to determine intellectual capacity. He believed that each race had a separate origin, a descending order of intelligence that could be determined, um, and he placed the Caucasians at the top and the Negroes at the lowest point. So his results were extensively published in three volumes, and then they went on to be used in textbooks um, and other um, collections around the world. So this is one from 1857, Glidden, and Morton's work, this is in a applicable to the Australian um, cases that Morton had collected, where he says here, this skull, item 78, is the nearest approach to the orangutan type that I have seen. It is truly an animal head. 
The forehead is exceedingly flat and recedent, while the prognathism of the superior maxillary almost degenerates into a muzzle. So, you know, quite disgraceful, but categorising on the basis of his interpretation of the measurements of these skulls from his collection. Paul Broca, a Frenchman, he further refines the measurement. He develops his system of anthropometry where you measure the length of long bones, the length of skulls, of course, and he develops special instrumentation to assist him to do this with his colleague. So the, the calipers that we've seen, um, other devices used to specify the, the, the diversions of crania, the measurement from the anion to the inion, for example, so from this point in the skull over the top to the back of the head and the, the inion at the back. He, um, he believes that humanity is composed of independent racial groups, Australian, Caucasian, Mongolian, Malayan, Ethiopian. So they all, all argue their cases. He, he sees that a uh, racial group is own species connected to a geographic location, and these guys were highly prolific. Um, authors of their day. Now, the skull collecting becomes a very much European global um, enterprise, for want of another word. In Australia, we have stories of settlers actually sending skulls that they found on their properties to the Australian Museum in Sydney, to the Queensland Museum here in Brisbane, the Melbourne Museum. And this leads to this kind of development where you may not have known of this story, but William Lunny, who, who was at the time reputed to be one of the last Tasmanians, uh, an Aboriginal man from Worcester Cove in Tasmania, he passed away and was taken to the hospital and, the, into, and he became a coroner's case because of um, the choleric diarrhoea that he succumbed from. Dr. William Crother was a medical examiner for the court and an honorary medical officer at the Hobart Hospital. And he, as soon as the body arrived, uh, dissected William Lunny's head in the hope that he could send it to the Hunterian Museum in London. And then Stokel, another intern or resident at, at the hospital, dissected his other, other, other body parts and in the hope of winning favour with the Royal Society of Tasmania. So, um, and th this continues to be, um, the key continues to be echoes of this history coming down through our history. So you may not be surprised, or you may be, but two months ago, in August 22, the decision was made by Hobart Council to remove Crothers statue. Uh, and he became Premier of Tasmania, this guy. Now, Arthur de Gobineau was another French dandy, a French aristocrat, and he wrote this tome, this massive tome, 1,400 pages, published in 1853, and he entitled it Essay on the Inequalities of the Human Race, and he was probably one of the major first academic racists. Uh, he proposed that there were only three races, according to him, black, white, and yellow, but he believed it was the single most important factor determining the nature of human society. White, white race was responsible for all, all the great advances in history and civilization. And this concept of race mixing or miscegenation would lead to the downfall of civilization. He argued that any positive accomplishments or thinking of blacks and Asians were due to an admixture with white blood. Now, of course, he he thought himself was descended from a white Nordic Aryan race up, up here, the green. Um, and he, of course, represented this Nordic Viking. Uh, he argued that white race was superior and it corresponded to this ancient Indo-European culture known as, as Aryan. And Germany, he argued, had just enough Aryan blood strain in within it to revive their white race. But he he kind of was very much a pessimist and, and saw that white society um, was in danger of being destroyed. Now, we, we're all aware of Charles Darwin's 1859 Origin of the Species and his theory of human evolution, the survival of the fittest. Galton was Darwin's cousin. And after reading Darwin's work, 
he noticed an interpretation. He basically said that in modern society at the time, we we're actually thwarting survival of the fittest by taking care of our underprivileged and weak. We had um, institutions where these people were actually surviving and living and um, didn't succumb to uh, a stronger enemy, for want of a better word. There's a prolific author at the time, an English statistician. He actually developed our um, regression to the mean and a lot of statistical concepts that are still in use today. And he introduced these questionnaires and surveys for collecting data in and took advantage of the latest technology, but he coins this term eugenics, and it's a hybrid word from the Greek you good or well, and the suffix born. So he's talking about well-born race stock kid in 83 in this in this work, inquiries into human faculty and its development. So eugenics was the belief and practice aimed at improving the inherited quality of the human population. Positive, there was positive aspect, positive eugenics, the promotion of higher reproduction through people with desired traits, but also negative eugenics, reducing the reproduction of people with less de desired traits. And he goes about using the, the camera, um, and which is a relatively new invention at the time. Uh, Eugene Fisher had also been using a camera to take photographs and look at the physical features of certain peoples and see what could be deduced from these. So this is all very observational. But I don't know if you can read this, but so these are the photographs that he took and the title, These are this is from one of his works. Composites made from portraits of criminals convicted of murder, manslaughter, or crimes of violence. And he's broken it down, he argues about three components, eight components, seven components. So he's looking at commonalities of features of, say, things like width of nose or or space between eye, eyes, um, things like this. Prevalent types of features among men convicted of larceny without violence. And, and what he's determining is that people are born with these inherent features or these predispositions which you're born with. There's nothing you can do about it. It's predestined. It's how you are. And there comes to be a, a sense of the possibility of actually solving some of these problems, such as poverty, sexual perversion, prostitution, criminality, alcoholism. Um, people with low moral sense uh, is the term that's used. By preventing the breeding of these inferior types and inversely encouraging the breed in breeding of, of superior people, people without flaws. This is the Jewish type profile shots as well as frontal shots. Now, his work impresses an American named Charles Davenport. And Dav Davenport goes over to meet Galton and he requests Galton's moral support to establish a research institution in the, in, in the US. He gains favor from wealthy uh, Americans, the Carnegie Institution, um, a woman called Harriman, who was the wife of a very wealthy rail magnate at the time. And this is the letter that he writes to Galton. And he's, he's seeking support. He wants to um, create a some kind of record office or a eugenic record office, looking at evolution at Cold Spring Harbor in Long Island in New York. And he achieves that. By 1904, he's become the director of the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, where he founds what's called the Eugenics Record Office in 1910. And this is a, a pamphlet from 1910. Um, he partnered up with a man called Harry Lachlan. And I've just summarised some of this content, but basically the principal business of eugenics is to educate organised society where it will act within an eye to racial progress, encouraging the reproduction of the best blood and discouraging or preventing the reproduction of its worst strains there shall be fit matings and many children among those most richly endowed by nature and that hereditary defectives and degenerates shall not be permitted to reproduce at all. The state can be expected to take means to bring about these ends only when due pressure is brought to bear by the citizens. And he encourages people to record their family traits with these documents or questionnaires and schedules that he 
he publishes. And this institution becomes a repository for these questionnaires that are circulated. On the basis of this, there's eugenic health exhibits that are set up at fairs where people are um, encouraged to, to attend these sessions and learn about the science, cutting edge science of the day called eugenics. So this is a billboard from one of these fairs and it reads, it's, so these were lights that lit up with a, a battery inside of here and they all were timed at different timings. So it says, some people are born to be a burden on the rest. Learn about heredity. You can help to correct these conditions. This light flashes every 15 seconds. Every 15 seconds, $100 of your money goes for the care of persons with bad heredity, such as the insane, feeble-minded, criminals, and other defectives. This light flashes every 48 seconds. Every 48 seconds, a person is born in the United States who will never grow up mentally beyond that stage of a normal eight-year-old boy or girl. This light flashes every 50 seconds. Every 50 seconds, a person is committed to jail in the United States. Very few normal persons ever go to jail. This light flashes every 16 seconds. Every 16 seconds, a person is born in the United States. And this light flashes every seven and a half minutes. So look at the big time. Every seven and a half minutes, a high grade, a high grade person is born in the United States who will have ability to do creative work and be fit for leadership. About 4% of all Americans come with this class, within this class. So it's saying America needs less of these and more of these. And already there's this inbuilt anxiety that these people, there's becoming more of these are being born and in, instead of these. There's fitter family competitions that are held in um, in at these fairs. And it's like the, the show these days where livestock judging there's classes for judging human stock allowing families to submit themselves for judging by the fairs eugenic department and photos are published in the the um, local paper this is the fitter family that won at this particular show a, a medal was awarded which looks like that and this is a uh, one of the examination sheets from from one of these um contests. The required details for each included uh, things like their physical, mental or temperamental defects and also whether they had any special talents or gifts. Uh, so here we've got physical, mental or temporal de temperamental defects, myopia, uh, TB, so astigmatism, you know, short-sightedness, long-sightedness. Now another American, a Highly educated, Harvard, um, Henry Goddard, he's, he's a US, US psychologist. He um, wants to investigate whether we can more accurately determine the intellectual impairment of these people classed as feeble-minded. And it's a broad encapsulating term, it's very elastic. And he comes up with this scale, these terms, moron, are coined by him. Um, and he starts examining with the use of these rudimentary IQ tests to determine at what level of impairment a person would have. And you may not be able to read this, but he classifies an idiot as somebody mentally three years old and under, and they're only capable of self-preservation. A low-grade imbecile, mentally four to five years old, they're only capable of simple menial work. A medium imbecile, mentally six to eight years old, capable of simple manual work. High-grade imbecile, mentally eight to ten years old, complex manual work. And a moron, mentally ten to twelve years old, work requiring reason and judgment. So this there's this scale of, of ability. And he writes prolifically. He's looking a lot at immigrants at the time, uh, Jews, Hungarians, Italians and Russians as well as criminal populations. And the reason why is because it's based in New York, and as you may know, the influx of uh, immigrants into America between 1890 and 1915, so his, his working around 1913 to 1920 is pretty prolific. Over 15 million immigrants come into the US. 
So he starts conducting research on these people and using these questionnaires. And the thing is, there was always this inherent bias, not only coming from them being white men of uh, aristocracy and wealth, but, you know, these people come from uh, countries where they didn't speak English, so their ability to interpret the questions, there was this underlying un un underlying assumption anyway that they were more likely to be feeble-minded than citizens in the US. And he essentially wanted to be able to identify feeble-mindedness individuals by sight. And unsurprisingly, uh, his results from some of those preliminary tests, you know, 80% of Hungarians, 79% of the Italians, 87% of Russians, and 83% of Jews, he determined, were feeble-minded of those coming in. He also wrote this important study, this book, important in the, t in the fact that this was widely disseminated throughout um, America, UK, even Germany, and the Nazi propagandists, when they um, got in into power, used this story prolifically. But it was a story of a returned American um, soldier from the Civil War who married a what he calls a worthy Quakeress. But then he has a dalliance, a one-night stand with a feeble-minded tavern girl. And as a result of that, she gives birth to this whole um, lot of children, 10 children who come with the lowest, who are from this lowest stock. And what he's arguing is this hereditary um, handing on of this defective, of this defectiveness. Um, I've lost my pointer. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, there we go. Uh, and whereas on the other side, he has upright, worthy children uh, because of, of the birth of those children from this worthy Quakeress. So it's a case study in her hereditability of intelligence, moral ability. Now, there's another American also. And these, these guys all become part of the eugenic uh, movement. Madison Grant, very um, influential US lawyer. So just, just remember this name, Madison Grant. He writes this book called The Passing of the Great Race in 1916. It gets multiple editions. It's still being published in 1925. And he's worried that these people he's seeing coming into Ellis Island, once again with these swarthy skin, are damaging the purity and running to the, the downfall of the Nordic um, white race. So, and this really correlates a lot with Gobineau's map that we earlier saw. Um, now, a quote from his book, he writes, a rigid, select, a rigid system of selection through the elimination of those who are weak or unfit, in other words, social failures, would solve the whole question in 100 years as well as enable us to get rid of the undesirables who crowd our jails, hospitals and insane asylums. The individual himself can be nourished, educated and protected by the community during his lifetime, but the state through sterilisation must see to it that his line stops with him, or else future generations will be cursed with an ever-increasing load of misguided sentimentalism. This is a practical, merciful and inevitable solution of the whole problem and can be applied to an ever-widening circle of social discards, beginning always with the criminal, the diseased and the insane, and extending gradually to types which may be called weaklings rather than defectives, and perhaps ultimately to the worthless race types. So the eugenic movement spreads from across England, the US, Sweden, Australia, and we'll come more into Australia shortly. There's these World International Eugenic Congresses that are held. And this illustration comes from the 1921 Second Congress, but it's quite instructive. So it's basically a tree representing eugenics. And the, they're arguing that all of these disciplines, genetics, biology, statistics, medicine, surgery, psychiatry, all feed into this concept in one way or another politics, economics. So like a tree, eugenics draws its material from many sources and organises them into a harmonious entity. Now, 
this was very widespread. Um, Theodore Roosevelt, he writes to Davenport back in Cold Spring Harbor because Davenport sent him some memoirs. And he writes, they're very, uh, Mr. Davenport, thank you very much for the two men memoirs. They're very instructive. And from the standpoint of our country, very ominous. You say that these people are not themselves responsible. That is a society that is responsible. I agree with you if you mean, as I suppose you do, that society has no business to permit degenerates to reproduce their kind. It is really extraordinary that our people refuse to apply to human beings such elementary knowledge as every successful farmer is obliged to apply in his own stock breeding. Any group of farmers who permitted their best stock not to breed and let all the increase come from the worst stock will be treated as fit inmates for an asylum. Yet we fail to understand that such conduct is rational compared to the conduct of a nation which permits unlimited breeding from the worst stocks, physically and morally. While it encourages or connives at the cold selfishness or the twisted sentimentality as a result of which the men and women who ought to marry, and if married, have large families, remain celibate, or have no children, or only one or two. Someday we will realise that the prime duty, the inescapable duty of the good citizen, of the right type, is to leave his or her blood behind him in the world, and that we have no business to perpetuate citizens of the wrong type. So this is just after his pre presidency. And Virginia Woolf, she observes in London, you know, a diary entry from 1915. We met and had to pass a long line of imbeciles. The first was a very tall young man, just queer enough to look at twice, but no more. The second shuffled and looked aside. And then one realised that everyone in that long line was a miserable, ineffective, shuffling, idiotic creature with no forehead or no chin, an imbecile grin or a wild, suspicious stare. It was perfectly horrible. They should certainly be killed. That's from her diary. Now, the Australian um, scientific audience, the aristocracy, wasn't immune. Richard Berry, he was English-born, but he, he came to Australia. He attained the position of Professor of Anatomy at the University of Melbourne in 1905. And he was an anthropologist, he also specialised in the crania, in the skull measurements. And he amassed his own collection, which was only discovered, rediscovered in 2003. But he, he taught there until 1929. He also served as an honorary psychiatrist at Royal Melbourne and studied skulls of Aboriginals and mentally deficient children. And he was also used to or wanting to integrate these new technologies. So this lantern talk was uh, like a slide presentation using technology at the time. The, this lantern will demonstrate to you the causes, effects, social significance, cost of feeble mindedness. We'll get more onto him in, in a minute. World War One breaks out in 1914 and this totally obviously changes the world. The massive loss of young life. Germany loses two to three million dead and over four million wounded. And globally, there's over 18 million deaths, many wounded. But the arguments in Germany are that because of this, our best racial stock, our young men, our strong men, have been greatly destroyed. And there's this belief that we've been left with this inferior racial stock. And Unless we do something about it, this is going to have catastrophic ramifications. The, the, there's this realisation that we've spent enormous sums on maintaining these so-called asylums, um, these insane asylums for the care of mentally impaired people, uh, the gardens to maintain, the staffing, the food. Yet this is, you know, very close to... Well, after the Versailles Treaty, the um, economic measures that were imposed upon Germany, and there's deprivations at home where Germans are, are starving and um, having to eat you know, bread if they're lucky, and the shortage of food and day, day supplies. So there's this imbalance that's, that's seen. And around this time, 1920, after the war, these two authors, Binding and Hock, a jurist and a psychiatrist, write this most devastating tome. The sanctioning, the title is The Sanctioning of the Destruction of Life Unworthy of Life. And what they're arguing is that doctors should be permitted in circumstances to terminate a painful existence 
you can you can find the book. It's widely available. But I've just summarised some of the content. Bending splits people he considers worthy of death into one of three groups: two large ones and the middle one. Person who has been mortally wounded, so he's obviously thinking about long-term survival of post World War One veterans, or was terminally ill and has somehow communicated their wish to die. The person does not have to be in pain. It is enough that they are in helpless condition and that their condition is incurable. It is also relevant if the person could be saved in another situation. Second group, a person that is incurably mentally ill. Binding describes these people as having neither the will to die nor the will to live. They are living pointless lives and are a burden for society and their families. He also believed it would be unfair on carers to keep such lives unworthy of living alive. The third group, people belonging to the middle group, who are mentally healthy people, however, after suffering a serious injury, remain unconscious. If they are ever to awake, they will awake to a nameless suffering. So they write, or he writes, their killing should not be seen as a killing as such, but as saving the person from a terrible end. And we begin to see these new terms, this new language being used in, in Germany, ballast existence useless eaters, life unworthy of life, and sukkah pieces. Alfred Pertz is another German physician, another eugenicist. He attended the early meetings of the congresses. He comes up with this termina uh, terminology or this new area of study, particularly Germanic, called Rassen hygiene or race hygiene. And he expounds, once again, the virtues of the purity of the Nordic race. He creates a journal um, and he envisages this society that examines the moral and intellectual capacity of citizens to decide on marriage and the permitted number of children. That society, disabled children would be aborted. The sick and weak, twins and children whose parents are too old would be eliminated. So he, he argues this case. And... There's a number of German societies for race hygiene that are established throughout the world in Britain, Sweden, the United States, the Netherlands. Uh, so, you know, by 1932, the year before the Nazis take power, there's over 50 such institutes and over 100 journals of racial science across Germany. Also, this time, there's also growth in these de Gobineau societies um, promoting the same uh, racist re rhetoric that he formulated. Australia is not immune. The Racial Hygiene Association of New South Wales was founded in 1926 and was renamed. It's, it's now the Family Planning Association, which many are probably aware of. The Eugenic Society of Victoria actually continues till 1961. Uh, Wilfred Agar, another University of Melbourne academic, professor of zoology, he chairs the inaugural meeting there. And these are some of the titles of some of the lectures that are, are given during that period. <clears throat> and this is um, a table from Diana Wyndham's book, um, which talks about the eugenics organisation or outlines eugenic organisations in Australian states between 1911 and 1961 and the people, notable members involved. <clears throat> Now, Barry, in 1930, he, he writes this letter to the Eugenics Review, the major journal that was being used by the eugenics groups in Australia or read and contributed to, but it's also a global contributions. And just to, to summarise that, he basically says, Sir, I observe in your issue of April 1930, page six, that you attribute to me probably through some misunderstanding, not my own view and words, but those of a newspaper reporter, on the question of a national lethal chamber for the grosser types of our mental defectives. So this is like a gas chamber. I've never at any time or anywhere seriously suggested such a procedure, though I did say in the Times that I thought when all had been what I have, when, when, when all had seen what I have, that there would be many who would agree with me that such an act of extinction would be the kindest, wisest and best thing we could do for all concerned. In any case, I do not share your views as to the sanctity of human life or the almost insuperable legal and practical difficulties which a lethal chamber would involve. 
There was surely little or no sanctity of human life in the war, and there do not seem to be any legal difficulties involved in judicial murder by hanging. By a stroke of the pen, the politician condemns hundreds of thousands of his fellow men to death as fodder for cannon, and the law can always take away the sanctified life of the murderer. Why then should we be so anxious to preserve the life of the almost brainless, senseless, speechless idiots and imbeciles when it seems almost pathetic to condemn them to live their lives as helpless automata? Why spend, as I'm informed, England actually does, £93 per annum per head on such human refuse and only £12 per annum per head on the normal healthy child? And we seek the reply in the sanctity of human life and the sentimentality of a national ignorance which seems to believe that a human mind can exist without a human brain. So this is so by this time he had left <coughs> University of Melbourne and gone back to England in 1929. But, you know, it's quite um, staggering. In Germany, meanwhile, the measuring continues, looking at eye colour, looking at teeth structure, dental structure, skeletal structure, uh, in psychiatric clinics, throughout the countryside, roaming investigators, taking photographs, comparing photographs, profiles, looking at hair textures, using calipers, the old broker tool to measure nasal distances. This is a nurse, Eva Justin, who undertook a PhD on um, Roma and Sinti people. Uh, here's her using an eye chart, groups that she studied. And in Australia, Norman Tyndale used similar, the anthropologists used similar tools. So we see here the, the calipers at Cockatoo Creek in 1931. He was with a Harvard um, joint expedition with at, uh, Adelaide University collecting data. In Germany, more publications, Principles of Human Heredity and Race Hygiene, five books go to, um, this book goes to five editions before 1940. And so there's this global competition of academic enterprise in this space, of comparison of you know, Nordic race, Alpine race, Mediterranean race, um, Oriental, Mongoloid, various photographs. Now, just, just remember these names, Bauer, Fisher, Lenz. This is even translated into English in 1931. And Jews are classified as racial admixtures uh, by another influential author, Gunther. Now, in 1923, while Hitler's imprisoned in Landsberg, and it was more or less a, after the Beer Hall push, he, he stayed there, essentially. He was able to read the paper and have visitors, and this is a picture of his cell. But he reads Bauer, Fisher, and Lenz. He reads Gunther, and he reads Madison Grant's The Passing of the Great Race, the New York lawyer back there in um, writing in 1916 in Ellis Island. And he likes Grant's book so much that he actually feels compelled to write to the publisher in the U.S. and, and thank thank. Uh, them or thank, get get them to thank the author for his work, and he incorporates those ideas into Mein Kampf. His racial, some of his racial ideas. Ten years later, he becomes chancellor, and within six months, a new law is established: the law for the prevention of offspring with hereditary diseases. And the right government imposes this law for anyone who is suffering from a hereditary disease can be sterilised by surgical operation if, according to the experience of medical science, it is to be expected with great probability that his offspring will suffer from serious hereditary physical or mental defects, particularly target mental deficiency from birth, schizophrenics, what they call manic depressive lunacy, hereditary epilepsy, but also blindness, deafness, serious hereditary physical malformation, also alcoholism. And courts are established where you could refute the uh, determination that you should be sterilised, but then you have to prove your case. And once the court had decided that sterilisation must be carried out, it would be carried out, even against your will. So if you lost your case, bad luck, uh, you would be compulsory sterilised. 
And between 300 and 400,000 of these are before, performed by the end of the war, beginning in 1934. So this is before the war starts. And this becomes global news. Um, 400,000 Germans sterilized, 1,700 hereditary courts established. And this is a, a German um, leaflet compelling people to uptake or believe in in the um, value of sterilization. It reads up the top, sterilization is not punishment, but liberation. What parents would like to wish their children such a terrible lot? Who wants to be guilty of this? And this is talking about the sterilization law, rights law. In 1934, California has traveling exhibit, exhibits continuing as posters. If this man had been sterilized, then there would not have been born one asocial female, four deaf and dumb, three stammerers, two epileptics, one mentally deficient female, one deformed abnormal female, together 20 hereditarily diseased. And the feeble-minded breed feeble-minded. We pay the cost. So these are kind of influencing people and arguing this case of excess, excessive expenditure. The charts continue. In Germany, once again, the economic arguments, 60,000 Reichmark. This is what this person suffering from hereditary defects costs the community during his lifetime. Fellow citizen, that is your money too. An encouragement to read a, a magazine that's published by the Race Politics Office. In America, though, this had been going on for quite some time. And this um, shows a map of the states where eugenical sterilization had already been instituted by 1935. So the Germans were a little bit late. Um, and another chart, family stock of a, a woman sterilized by the state of Maine and determining inheritance and transmission of these um, traits in, in particular people within these flow charts, the insane, moron, feeble-minded, alcoholic, neurotic, sex pervert. We can't really make it out here. It's a bit blurry. And this publication is published by the Human Betterment Foundation in California, showing where laws have been introduced in which states, when these laws commenced. And then by 1936, how many people, male, female, had been sterilized in these particular states in this period? This is one of the forms, 13-year-old person, um, clinical history, mentally deficient girl whose presence at home was creating friction between mother and stepmother. So, you know, the diagnosis, mental deficiency, high imbecile level, undifferentiated type. So this what we'd see pseudoscientific um, diagnoses. And Germany argues the case. They, they use the global establishment of laws already to say, we're not standing alone here. Our law, our, our gazettes, um, this shows a, you know, a Nordic man, woman, the baby, you can't really make that out. She's holding the behind the shield of the law and it's saying this is the law for the prevention of hereditary disease offspring. Countries that have already enacted it, so USA, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Finland, and those that are considering it, including Japan, Poland, Switzerland, England, Hungary. In Melbourne, there's also attempts. There's three attempts to institute um, um, a eugenics bill and um, each of them fail but they are also targeting these wider groups, these slum dwellers, homosexuals, prostitutes, alcoholics, as well as those with small heads and with low IQs. So this is terminology from, from the day. And then um, it passes in 1939, but the outbreak of the war changes things significantly. But this is interesting from this meeting in 1940 because here we have an argument that's um, from the judge so Judge Foster made some remarks about mental deficiency and eugenics that are not like to see pass unchallenged. This is Guy Springthorpe. The inheritance of mental defectiveness is still an open question. Some authors say that the percentage of mental defectives who have inherited defectiveness are 80 percent. Others put the percentage as low as 20 percent. So it was still a question. Uh, and similar in, in Victoria, um, 
action to institute bills. 1935, Germany introduces two new laws, the law for the protection of German blood, known as the Nuremberg Laws, and German honour, which prohibited marriages and extramarital intercourse between Jews and Germans and forbade the employment of German females under 45 in Jewish households and the Reich citizenship law, where in order to be a citizen, you had to have German blood. So it was all based on racial purity. And looking back at the grandparents, so this is Deutsch blood, full-blooded, and then mixed blood, this, that concept of miscegenation, where if your grandparents were Jewish, and you had a propensity to be Jewish uh, right down. Queensland wasn't immune. This is a Queensland government document of a man I've been, I've been working with his great grandson. Uh, here you can see breed, cross out descriptions not required, full blood, half caste, quadroon. This is, and this is a school attendance list from the Deeping Creek Mission School, Aboriginal school where the division of students is according to the colour of their skin. So up here it says pure blacks, copper, half caste and white. This is from about 1920. And then Tyndale, who we saw earlier making the plaster casts, he looks at, um, he dissects in this joint survey of the work that he'd undertaken with the Harvard group this definition of mixed bloods of half castle, this terminology of quarters, blood, one eighths, one, you know, different variants of blood and descendancy. And in Germany, this illustrated um, slide coming from the front page of one of the major anti Semitic newspapers, De Sturma, this title reads Infectious Germs, and under here it says, with his poison, the Jew destroys the sluggish blood of weaker peoples, so that a diagnosis arises of swift degeneration. But us, however, the case is different. The blood, I can't read that. Uh, the blood is pure, we are healthy. Um, and more photographs of different variants of, in German te textbooks, um, mixed blood, first degree, father German blooded, mother Jewess, comparisons. There's public education of with these photos. This title reads, the Jewish question can only be solved by a clear separation of the non-Jews from the Jews. And these are these moulded plaster heads that we saw earlier, skulls, photographs, looking at racial differences, geographical maps. And this is Norm, uh, the nurse Eva Justin creating a plaster cast of a Roma person. This is Norm Tinsdale doing similarly at Cockatoo Creek in 1931 of an Aboriginal man. The plaster heads look like on display. So in 1939, out just before the outbreak of war, a new directive comes from the Reich Ministry of Interior where there's a duty to report deformed births by the midwife who has assisted in the birth. And the midwife's paid a fee per reporting each case where idiocy and mongolism, particularly involving blindness and deafness, microcephalic, hydrocephalic, deformities of every kind, in particular the absence of limbs, spina bifida, etc., needed to be reported to the health office. And then a few months later, just after the outbreak of war, Right Ministry of Interior again distributes circulars to all the directors of all the asylums and clinics in the Reich, in which mentally ill, epileptics and the feeble-minded are cared for on a long-term basis. All patients had to be reported who could not work and suffer from schizophrenia, epilepsy, senile illnesses, and all of those terms that were used in the original legislation that we saw earlier. Also, those that have been continuously in the institution for five years, as well as criminal lunatics and those that do not possess German nationality or were not of German blood. So these, this is what the forms look like. It's a blank one in English. So it's demographic details, uh, how long the person's been, what diagnoses they have. And some of the directors used 
information they already had on hand. So this is a patient identification card of a, a young lady named Susa Feuerstein. She was held in the Arnsdorf institution with a diagnosis of schizophrenic. She was a Jewish uh, woman. We'll talk more about her presently. So war breaks out, and this important letter is backdated to the, the start of the war, but it's from Hitler, and he writes, Reichsleader Buhler and Dr. Medicine Brandt are charged with the responsibility to broaden the authority of certain doctors to the extent that persons suffering from illnesses judged to be incurable may, after a humane, most careful assessment of their condition, be granted a mercy death. So Brandt's uh, Hitler's escort efficient, uh, physician, and him and Buhler set about undertaking this um, action. Numerous psychiatrists, numerous doctors are appoint, appointed. This group here were known as appraisers. So we'll look at Schumann and Gorgas in a little bit more detail. Here's Gorgas here. If you could um, close up in about five minutes or so, so that we can yes, move on to uh, Michael's presentation. Is sure. that possible? Yes, that's fine. Um, Jewish. This, this is a form that's completed by Sarah, uh, it's completed by one of the doctors. You can see here three assessors plus one as an overseer assessor determines the execution of this person essentially. So Sarah Clara, she's Jewish as well as schizophrenic and this um, classification that she, she's useless. And Euthanasia facilities are established in six locations eventually, not all at once, but from 1940, Brandenburg, Bernberg, Hernerstonenstein, Hadamar, Grafenek and Hartheim. Psychiatry, very much part of this. Um, this psychiatrist, Erbel, he becomes the commandant of Brandenburg and Bernberg, as well as Treblinka death camp. And there's an elaborate structure where the medical administration um, of T4, Tiergartenstrasse 4 in Berlin, oversees this process of looking at the registration forms, obtaining them from the institutions, uh, photocopying them, assessing them, distributing them to a transport section, sending them to the institutions, and the patients are then sent to killing facilities. There's a statistics department as well. It's a letter uh, from um, giving instruction of what to do. Transport lists. One of the gas chambers at Grafenek made in a, a garage between 1940, January and Pernestonestein, where it was an upper floor, a basement and the gas chamber, and numbers of executions. Statistics are compiled by the statisticians. Uh, this is one nurse that I've explored in great detail, who was working at Grafenek, as well as Perna Schonenstein, and Susa Feuerstein, that we just earlier met. She was murdered at Perna Schonenstein and I'm, I work with her great niece now. The, the savings that were made according to the Nazi statisticians, the research that was undertaken, the terminology that was still being used, the trials, and his gore gas who was at the gassing lever. So these people took advantage of the vulnerable and weak, obviously. They saw them as biological samples, life unworthy of life. Um, they knew about these people. They worked with them for many years in some cases. And after the euthanasia program, some of the nurses continued on. So Glay worked at the Belzec extermination camp in Ponitova in Poland. And even in 1947 in Australia, 
AP Elkin, Professor of Anthropology at University of Sydney, same terminology, looking at Aboriginal people. So there you go, Trun truncated ending. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Darman, for that. And I'm sorry to call, uh, call you short there, um, but we did uh, start a little bit delayed. Okay, I'm going to move straight on to um, the next speaker, uh, Michael Robertson, uh, who will be speaking on Beyond Godswin's Law, the Importance of the Kranken Murder for Contemporary Bioethics, a segue into the, the rest of the symposium and seminar series. So thank you. Thank you very much, um, Jackie, and also thank you to Darren, who had a very difficult task of trying to distill so much history into such a time, so uh, uh, props to you. Um, I will um, try and move quickly through and advance the slides, at least. Um, firstly, just to outline the reference to Godwin's Law. Now, Godwin, Mike Godwin is a lawyer working in the US who created an internet meme which basically reads, the longer an internet discussion grows on, the higher the probability that somebody will mention the Nazis or Hitler as a precedent. Um, what that has come to be a signifier of is reference to facile comparisons to the Nazi period. So, oh, we can't do this because that's what the Nazis did. That, unfortunately, has been the approach taken to bioethics in the light of the Nazi period, particularly in the light of the Kranken order. And what I'm proposing is um, to try and progress that conversation so that we can understand the historical significance of this period of history uh, to contemporary bioethics. Now, there are no doubt many bioethicists in the audience. I don't propose to um, explain the already known, but bioethics, biomedical ethics, a form of applied moral philosophy addressing uh, a multitude of enterprises in biomedical science, uh, traversing areas including clinical ethics, um, genetics, genomics, end-of-life decision-making, disability studies, reproductive rights and the like. Um, so biomedical ethics is a broad um, line of inquiry incorporating multiple discourses and multiple perspectives, examining um, technologies that are often emerging and not fully understood and their implications not fully apprehended. Now, as we have discussed in the book that Professor Leach Scully referenced, um, we take the position that the best way, or at least our preferred way, to approach an understanding of the significance of mid-century history to uh, bio, uh, bioethics is the methodology of biopower. Now, it's not uh, a detergent, uh, as the name might suggest, but rather a term that first emerges in the later works of Foucault, particularly in his History, uh, history of Sexuality in 1976, and he later develops the concept in a series of lectures he gave at the Collège de France. The core idea of Foucault's construct of biopower is the integration of sovereign power with biological science and the reformulation of politics as ultimately control over life. Foucault introduces the term governmentality to invert the ancient legal apparatus of Roman law of pater familias, which is the right of the state to let live or make die. In essence, governmentality in Foucault's construction of biopower inverts this to one of making live or letting die. Um, so Foucault then talks about a shift of power from the sovereign to discursive power, the formation of power generated by particular forms of discourse, evident in what he describes as discursive formations, professional societies, um, individual groups, institutions, the sorts of um, discursive power that we saw in Darren's talk about eugenics and the discourse of eugenics and the, and the power that it exerts in the modern state. So in Foucault's formulation, discursive power resides in institutions and professions and it's implemented by bureaucracies and other organs of the modern state. For Foucault, biopower, biopolitics is ultimately control over bios, control over life, and it's exercised both at the level of the individual and at the population in a term that he refers to as massification. Now Foucault further elaborated the notion of the dispositif which is loosely translated as urgent need, that provides a pretext to the coercive exercise of biopower by the state. The dispositive can be conceptualised as a network of different discourses, institutional responses or laws in response to a, a 
defined or perceived crisis. An obvious example of this is the recent exercise of various forms of coercion during the COVID pandemic. The transatlantic discourses over racial hygiene and eugenics, outlined by Darren in his presentation, that characterises the moral panic following the collapse of the great empires and the advent of the 1920s pandemic and later global economic crises in the early to mid 20th century were also examples of pretexts for the dispositif, the perceived threat to the population posed by inferior racial and genetic stock, stock which then leads to an initiation of a state-directed program of registration, exclusion, sterilisation and ultimately mass murder in the Nazi state. The Polish-American philosopher Zygmunt Bauman formulates the Holocaust ultimately as the extreme formulation of modernity in its solid form, which involves the removing of unknowns and uncertainties through the exertion of human control over nature. Such control is achievable through which, uh, establishing hierarchical bureaucracies and the construction and enforcement of rules, regulations and forms of control and categorization applied to the population. Now, uh, biopower in its current state in the academy is an amalgam of ideas that build on Foucault's foundational work but has integrated multiple theoretical perspectives. Um, it is a, at times, desultory collection of ideas. Um, and recent work by um, Robert Sparrow and Catherine Mills, our former colleague from uh, Sydney Health Ethics, has tried to establish a taxonomy of the polysemous nature of biopower. There are different ways in which biopolitics and biopower can be approached, whether it's from the perspective directly of biology, uh, from the perspective of population, from the perspective of the social world, a transhistorical um, a, a survey of different forms of the relation between the state and the, bio, and the, and the, the bios. Uh, biopolitics is an um, epistemological process and how knowledge is constructed. Biopolitics is a form of regulation, ideology, or ultimately a methodology to approach bioethical discourse. Similarly, Sparrow and Mills interrogate the polysemous nature of the concept of life, whether it is biological existence and vitality, particular mode of existence, such as what is life like in New York? Um, the exist in more ontological concepts, is there life on Mars? Narrative concepts of life, the notion of a life lived. So there are different ways of understanding what this bios, the focus of biopolitical and bio, uh, biopower approach, uh, actually addresses. But as shown in the Nazi regime, the extreme authoritarian settings of biopower becomes the literal question of life and death. This is what Foucault and later writers term thanatopolitics. Foucault considers the Holocaust and related crimes by the Nazi state as the logical extension of biopower through the revisit revisitation of the right of the sovereign to kill, an exercise of coercive power at the level of life, species, race, and population. Foucault saw that genocide is the ultimate expression of biopower or biopolitics. Despite the traditional definition of genocide interrogating the deliberate elimination of a national, ethnic, racial or religious group, many in the field of disability studies have argued that disability is as much a social category as race. Moreover, any reading of mid uh, first part of your, uh, 20th century history in the United States or Europe sees the categories of disability and race as manifestations of biological inferiority or biological othering and therefore the pretext uh, for exclusion and ultimately annihilation. These uh, images from the um, Sydney Nolan exhibition at the Sydney Jewish Museum really uh, spoke to me about this concept of um, bare life, which is a concept I'll introduce in a moment. So Thanato politics is at the core of the work of philosopher Giorgio Agamben. Agamben defines modernity as the point where the human species becomes the focus of politics, the state, and by extension, the focus of the state bureaucracy. In this understanding, the individual is absorbed in the biomass of population, or in the case of the Nazi regime, de folk. Agamben invokes the ancient figure homo sasseur as a metaphor for those excluded from society and its protections, living within the law, but not protected by the law. This creates a situation uh, based in the ancient concept of bare life, life without the privileges or rights of citizenship. For Agamben, the Holocaust was the fullest realisation of biopower and the concentration camp its ultimate manifestation. Agamben argues that when the state shifts into an authoritarian mode in circumstances of perceived or manufactured threat, it creates what he terms states of exception, 
This is a state of virtual war on certain parts of the population and a means of social exclusion and ultimately elimination. The musulmana of the concentration camp, the diseased and starved figures of Polish ghettos, or the inmates of starvation houses in decentralised euthanasia centres are reduced to bare life in these states of exception. <clears throat> Agamben's formulation of bare life is a methodological approach in disability studies as applied to bioethics. This is all the more salient in what the current Royal Commission into the plight of Australians living with disabilities is indicating, or perhaps rather confirming what we already suspected. So in the historicization of the Nazi period, the Krankenmorder, which is the term referred to the aggregate of crimes perpetrated by the Nazi state against people living with illness or disability, um, is one of the many victim groups adjacent to the attempted Jewish, uh, genocide of European Jewish civilization. So what this diagram indicates is, again, it's a taxonomy of victimology of the Nazi period. We have the direct um, persecution and attempted elimination of the Jewish people as the Shoah, but it sits perhaps primum inter pares with other victim groups, such as the Prajmos against the Sintian Roma people, the gay holocaust, the so-called pink triangle victims, the million or so Soviet prisoners of war murdered in, by the Nazi regime, the systematic murder of Poles and Slavs in occupied territories. These are all different victim groups. They don't seek to remove the quintessential suffering of the Jewish people in the Holocaust, but it interrogates that there were different groups per uh, persecuted in very similar ways by the Nazi regime, ultimately on the basis of biological othering. So prior to my exploration of the topic of assisted dying, which is the one topic that isn't addressed in the later seminars in this series, I want to reiterate that Krankenmorde, the preferred term in German historiography, is to indicate that the euphemism of euthanasia used by the Nazis are two distinct concepts. So whilst the term euthanasia is the frequent historical reference point, it is a gross um, euphemism for a program of mass murder. That said, so in a sense, the Krankenmorde, or whether you're talking about Axion T4 or decentralised euthanasia, are not historical precedents of assisted dying, but it represents an extreme manifestation of biopower that can inform discourses over assisted dying, and in particular, the implications of that for people with living with disabilities. So to quote from the book um, I published in 2019 with Edwina and Astrid, People with mental illnesses, disabilities, or otherwise deemed unworthy of life were starved, gassed, electrocuted, lethally drugged, or died in the course of tests of other killing methods, after which their bodies were exploited or defiled before being disposed of in crematoria or mass graves. This is not a historical precedent for assisted dying legislation in Victoria or New South Wales, but rather a manifestation of extreme thanato politics. Okay. So the current conceptualisation of assisted dying comes down to two approaches. Um, that is active voluntary euthanasia in a so-called medical model, which is the production of death, for want of a better phrase, uh, by the state mediated through the medical profession, as against the civil rights model represented by physician-assisted suicide. Now, this is the standard approach in assisted dying legislation in all Australian jurisdictions and most in the United States. The one instance where we see the medical model of, assisted, of, of active voluntary euthanasia is in the Benelux countries, which is a different category of intervention. We also see, um, categorised under assisted dying, passive voluntary euthanasia or passive non-voluntary euthanasia, which are not necessarily addressed in assisted dying legislation but are still practices within the health system that have ethical significance. So to return to um, the potential ways to approach assisted dying in the light of the Krankham model, we can look at uh, different ways in which biopolitics and life are constructed. So the trans-historical approach, looking at different historical precedents and understanding how the state might intervene in death uh, as a form of biopower. Um, ideological approaches you know, and, and the motivations of the state or its theoretical or ethical preconditions or particular methodological approaches to see commonalities between historical antecedents and current practices. 
Also, in terms of the control over death and as a manifestation of biopower, we need to understand how life might be formulated. Is it about merely the extinction, extinction of life? Is it about an existential continuum? Is it about some sort of narrative approach to individual autonomy? So there are obviously different ways in which we can come at this beyond just simply, we shouldn't do this because that's what the Nazis did, which is really what the God-winning paradigm uh, interrogates. Now, historian Geoffrey Cox um, has argued that a unique form of German modernity, the so-called Zonderweg, or special path, linked the embodiment of the construct of the German individual identity and selfhood with industrialization and modernization against the failure of political liberalism to take hold in Germany after a wave of revolutions in 1848. This is what the historian A.J.P. Taylor referred to as the historical turning point where Germany failed to turn. The individual was subservient to the greater good. Cox notes that the social, economic and political organisation of material interests in modern Germany was a vital condition determining individual and social experience. Um, he notes that the scores of wounded and traumatised soldiers returning from the uh, First World War battlefields uh, found on the streets of Weimar, Germany, and Hitler's own experience of surviving being gassed in the trenches um, were influential um, in the Nazi project. In this, German attitudes dis disability transitioned in an arc from sympathy for the homeless to impoverished wounded veterans of the 1914-18 war to a malevolent and destructive philosophy steeped in racial and eugenic theories. As noted by historian Robert Proctor, the Nazi biomedic biomedical project traded in medical metaphors and asserted that the most paternalistic form of biopolitics by invoking the idealised Aryan ethnostate as a metaphorical body, the so-called Volkskörper, the people's body. The health of the German people was critical to its economic and war-making power and saw the implementation of public health initiatives such as anti-tobacco advertising, healthy diets and workplace safety, all forms of biopower in a very paternalistic form by the state. The irony was the widespread anxiety and depression in Nazi Germany, self-medicated by the abuse of over-the-counter available methamphetamine, marketed as pervitin and the explosion of suicidal behaviour at the end of the war. As in the fame Flusterwitz, which translates as whispered joke, what does the ideal Aryan look like? As tall as Goebbels, as slim as Goering, and as blonde as Hitler. The analysis from the perspective of um, biopower enables us to understand how seemingly enlightened public health practices not out of place in today's society is juxtaposed with the annihilation of the sick and genetically undesirable in that they are both exercises of control of the state over the biology of the population biomass. Historical anxieties such as the Malthusian dilemma of the exponential population growth versus the linear growth of food production adds to the moral panic that enables malignant eugenic discourses enabling the Kranken water. Um, Darren cited this in his presentation. The argument from utility, the utilitarian position, frequently the default ethical or normative ethical approach in, in, in bioethics, it also holds as a strong precondition to the coercive biopolitical power we see in the Kranken mortar. In 1945, the US Army uh, war crimes investigators chanced upon a document at the Hartheim Killing Center uh, providing the economic rationalization for the Axion T4 component of the Kranken mortar. Uh, as saying that after the murder of, or after the elimination, shall we say, of 70,000 so-called useless eaters, there were substantial savings to the folk, um, and in true German style, passed down to specific expenditures on different food items. The biopolitical control of death is another potent theme in the relationship between the state and the biomassified population. For centuries, suicide is criminalised in pre-enlightened sovereignties under the influence of Christian churches. As Hamlet's existential dilemma notes, interminable psychological suffering could not be resolved by in inducing death. So this holds in virtually all jurisdictions uh, in a post-Enlightenment world, and uh, in noting the um, Binding and Hocker uh, monograph that uh, Darren referenced, um, there is the introduction of the potential of the state to intervene in the death of citizens, particularly the category of the so-called incurable idiots who are the terrible image of real people which cause horror in each person who faces them. I'm sort of getting a bit tired of this historical ableism. Um, 
Now, to revert the, the reverse engineering of the elimination of the biological other as a mercy death was at the core of the legal defences to those brought to trial for the Konkan Water. In the so-called doctor's trial in Nuremberg in 1946, former neurosurgeon and Hitler's escort physician Karl Brandt, the quintessential Nazi doctor, averred, would you believe that it was a pleasure for me to receive the order to start euthanasia? For 15 years I had laboured at the sick bed and every patient was to me like a brother, every sick child as I worried about as if it had been my own. And then that hard fate hit me. Is that guilt? Was it my first thought to limit the scope of euthanasia? Did I not, the moment I was included, try to find a limit as well as finding a cure for the incurable? Were not the professors of the universities there? Who could, be, who could there be who was more qualified? In the parallel Soviet-controlled universe, one of the leaders of Axion T4, Hermann Paul Nietzsche, um, contended that his, in his trial in Dresden in 1946, that in the case of very damaged patients, euthanasia was the only option and that when he reviewed the files of patients murdered in the various sites in the Konkan Water, he was convinced by examining many of the photos of the victims that this was the correct course of action. Nietzsche claimed that for him, it was really the, from the perspective of the patient that this was gnadentod, meaning mercy death, ending a life that was a torture for the patient and the family. After Nietzsche's conviction and capital sentence, his lawyer continued the argument that Nietzsche's motivations were entirely benevolent, specifically that gnadentod, was an act of mercy, and that if Nietzsche was guilty of crimes against humanity, then countless other philosophers, jurists, academics, and physicians were also guilty. Now, reading the room and the popular discontent with the murder of fellow Germans in the euthanasia program, the Nazi propaganda office had shifted its efforts to create popular support for its killing program by a stylistic shift from hateful anti-disability propaganda demonising the genetically inferior as monstrous, to a more subtle messaging of the state using its powers to alleviate intolerable suffering. The release in 1941 of the film Ich Klage An, which translates as I Accuse, with its high production values and professional acting, attempts to justify the mercy killing by the state of normal people with intractable suffering by offering up the tragedy of a beautiful and capable female figure struck down by disease, in this case multiple sclerosis. In keeping with the times, the medical model of mercy death of an infantilised female character is implemented by a paternalistic male acting as a symbol of state biopower or biopolitics. The moral arc travelled by the male protagonist finding its expression in his dramatic monologue in the interminably long court scene at the end of this film. This narrative structure is identical to the plot of Million Dollar Baby a film whose disturbing ableism was seemingly sanitised by its unprecedented success in the 2004 Oscars. Indeed, the theme of mercy death in cases of evaluated life lacking quality or meaning or the burden posed by the disability or physical or cognitive impairment lurks in all forms of contemporary cinema. We see a moral equivalence in um, the uh, last card of Darwin saying, well, I should be able to access mercy death because of my intractable cancer in the way that I should be able to end the life of my dementing wife uh, or my high-level spinal, uh, high spinal lesion boyfriend. Seems to be this tacit assumption in films about euthanasia that there is some form of disability underlying its justification. In Australia, federal biopolitical power has reversed from the extreme paternalism seen in the federal usurpation of the sovereignty of the Northern Territory in the 1990s to the presumption of the inevitability of assisted dying legislation in all Commonwealth jurisdictions. Legislation is now predicated on the civil rights model as against the original medical model seen in the Northern uh, seen in the Benelux countries and in the Northern Territory. The right to die, the ultimate expression of liberal autonomy, now resides in discourses in human rights as determined by the National Commission, uh, National Commission on Human Rights, which presents as a bulwark against the coercive exercise of biopolitical power in assisted dying. It states the right to life does not, as a corollary, include a right to choose to die, but nor does it require a state to ensure that a person's life is protected when this is against the express wishes of that person. In a case of a request for voluntary euthanasia, the state's obligation to protect life must be balanced against the right to personal autonomy, which is contained in a right to privacy. It would seem, from a human rights perspective, the option exists to support legislation of voluntary euthanasia practices, provided that sufficient safeguards are put in place to prevent arbitrary, including discriminatory, deprivations of life. <clears throat> 
If we pass the language of the recently implemented New South Wales legislation, the focus of assisted dying through assisted suicide is based on self-determination by a competent subject capable of rational thought and communicative action in situations of evident medical futility or relief of suffering. However, the lived experience of Benelux countries and the apparent bracket creep of situations enabling medicalised assistant dying into circumstances of intractable suffering from psychiatric disorder, many examples of which exist in circumstances merely of social suffering rather than psychopathological distress, this presents an understandably neuralgic point to those living with disability and their allies or advocates. History demonstrates well-intentioned and seemingly enlightened assisted dying legislation is vulnerable to the hermeneutics of history, politics and economics. The Local Human Rights Commission cites the UNCRPD injunction of equality before the law. However, the evident blindness of such laws is vulnerable to miscontextualised judgments of the concepts of life and the changing influence of the power of the state and its organs over the biomass of the population. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Can we please applaud um, both Michael and Darren's presentation? I'm hoping Darren is still with us online. Now, I'm, I'm aware and you're aware that we're overrunning for time, but what we will now do is move to um, some, a brief panel discussion. It will perforce have to be very brief, but we will um, you draw on the expertise of uh, Michael again, uh, of Karen Soldatic, who is with us uh, in, in the audience to come up to the table. Um, we had been due to have Amanda Tink joining us uh, online, but unfortunately she is unable to. Uh, and we also have uh, Jan uh, Lanicek uh, with us online. <laughs> and I'll, I'll also um, chair uh, this particular uh, section. I'm going to ask um, all the panellists to give their um, immediate responses from their own expertise to what they've um, just been hearing. And I'm going to ask um, Jan, Dr. Jan Lanacek, who's uh, Associate P Professor in Modern European and Jewish History at this university, UNSW, uh, who's also currently completing a study of post-Holocaust judicial retribution in Czechoslovakia and researches Jewish migration to Australia before World War II. I'm going to ask um, Jan to go first, because um, unlike uh, Karen and Amanda and also Michael, uh, he is unable to um, be part of the subsequent webinar series. So um, Jan, if you can hear me, and if it, everything's OK at your end, would you um, like to give a brief, a few minutes response from your expertise as to, on what you've just heard? Sure. Uh, okay, good. Uh, I hope the echo. Uh, um, so, no, thanks, uh, Darren and Michael, for really, really interesting uh, presentations. And I've been thinking about uh, how I could contribute. Uh, I just was taking a few notes uh, during your talks. And one thing which always uh, struck me as, uh, as a historian, as a teacher of the Holocaust, is that how thoroughly discussed the whole idea of eugenics and of killing had been even before the actually actual plans were put into practice and or executed. And that we have these plans, these ideas coming not uh, from some obscure uh, ideologues, uh, far-right politicians sitting in pubs and uh, venting frustration, but that these ideas about the need to cleanse society of uh, useless eaters and or those who don't contribute come from the most educated parts of society. Uh, 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 scientists, uh, physicians, uh, psychiatrists, and who argue 
uh, for all the reasons that you outlined. And I think that the role of the First World War and the way that how many young, healthy, strong men are killed and those who are disabled, they can't go to fight, so they are protected in the vision of the world uh, is, is also, also important. So it reminds me of a quote from one historian who says that when this T4, the euthanasia campaign, so-called euthanasia campaign started, it was a program whose principles had been widely and thoroughly discussed in society, not in a way of how it happened later. And we, it was a secret program, but it was something which they tried to try to kind of communicate. Michael, sorry, now Darren, you showed the flashing light exhibit from the US about how much money uh, it costs to look after disabled people. It reminds me of the educational materials in Nazi Germany. Mm. And uh, when children at the elementary school have to calculate how much it costs uh, for uh, to look after disabled person and then calculate how many marital loans for young, healthy, strong uh, uh, people you could kind of provide instead. So that's that's really kind of the way to communicate. I prepared a few comments about the film that, uh, that Michael mentioned, uh, I accused, but I will skip it because it was discussed in your presentation. The last uh, comment uh, I want to emphasize or mention is uh, the widespread participation in the mass murder in Nazi Germany. Uh, there are always discussions about how people could do such things. How can they can commit such crimes? In fact, uh, I think it's easy to find people who uh, are capable of doing these crimes. Uh, it's more difficult maybe to persuade the society about doing that, but to find the perpetrators is always, always easy. And again, we have physicians, uh, Mike, uh, Darren, you gave the list about 60 physicians who none of them is uh, compelled, none of them is forced to take part in these programs. They can opt out if they don't want to. Um, most of them are young, ambitious uh, physicians who want to prove themselves, who want to establish careers. It's interesting that all the established uh, professionals of uh, doctors, they reject mostly, but the young ambitious in their late 20s, early 30s, they, they, they do it mm. for various reasons. Not only ideology, but they, maybe they really believe. And also, final part, because of the time, the participation of women in, in genocide. We usually imagine Holocaust perpetrated as a man with a rifle. If we think about in the gender dimension, the most common perpetrator of the Nazi crimes is a woman in white cloth as, as a nurse. Uh, who kills because uh, she believes that is justified by the doctor who is the authority mm -hmm. and uh, who kind of provides these these orders or issues the orders that this child uh, is sick and needs to be released from the suffering and then she executes it so a lot of these uh, victims of uh, the so-called euthanasia campaign are, 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 are murdered by by nurses by women and that's important to mention as well. I, I, will, I will stop here. Thank you, Jan. Thank you for those comments. And um, I'll ask now Professor Kamen Soldatic, who's part of the School of Social Sciences and the Institute for Culture and Society at Western Sydney uh, University, who's uh, researched on global welfare regimes um, and has 30, 20 years experience sorry, as an international, national and state-based senior policy analyst, researcher and practitioner. And later in this series, um, on the 9th of November, in fact, uh, Cameron will be talking on eugenics in Australian immigration policy. Um, Cameron, do you have some thoughts on today's symposium? Uh, thanks so much, Jackie, and thank you so much. Oh, is it on? Uh, thanks so much, Jackie, and your team for having me here today. And um, really want to thank Darren and Michael for fantastic um, presentations. And I think really important presentations because actually I think in Australia we don't really hear enough in public lectures about the role of eugenics and how um, important it was 
and in some ways still remains in how we think about um, what is Australia and who is Australia, who is Australian now in everyday life. Um, one of the things I really, um, I, I would like to, I guess, just continue on um, from the aspect of gender. And I think um, one of the things um, that I would like to see a lot more work done in, on eugenics and particularly in Australia is the way that eugenics is actually um, quite substantially gendered. Um, as we just heard, we heard of the role of um, women. Women play a critical role in the area of, um, you know, the whole idea of a woman being a carer where actually if we think about uh, nurses, the number of women who are employed in nursing positions, um, you know, that there, there's a huge gender dynamic if we think about uh, you, the, the eugenics period, particularly um, at, at, at its worst um, between the First and Second World War. Um, the other issue too is I think um, it was just touched on and one thing I do find uh, that I particularly, I don't think the word is enjoy, is the right word, um, but when I read um, eugenics history coming from Americans, one thing I think they do really well is actually really map out, um, and I think the, they're wrong words to say, you know, there was positive eugenics and negative eugenics. I, I think they're probably the wrong words to use because, you know, encouraging women to reproduce because those women are seen to have value based on their class, racial position. Um, but I, I would like to see more work, particularly in Australia, um, in terms of how, um, how these policies um, uh, in the reproductive sphere uh, really um, were separated and developed. And uh, I guess one thing in my own work, when we think about the whole population and perish narrative in Australia that really um, occurs between the First World War and the Second World War uh, is, the, is the interrelationship, which I'll talk a little bit more about, um, the aspect of um, migrant children um, from different parts of the world and how they're selected of particular kinds, um, the practices of child removal within um, new migrant families in Australia um, when uh, migrant mothers are deemed um, poor or unworthy mothers. Um, and the other thing too, I think, which needs a lot more focus in terms of a gendered reproduction um, uh, thinking in Australia eugenics period is actually, you know, we were the leaders in um, really implementing maternity payments, um, especially after the First World War as part of the building of the welfare state post-1907 as part of that social democratic ideal. But um, it's not just thinking about it in terms of a social democratic ideal, but thinking about the ways in which this was really driven by eugenics ideas around uh, race and the reproduction of an able-bodied fit um, nation and a, a, a white middle-class nation eventually. So um, thank you, it was really exciting and I, I, it's really great to see this series um, come online. So thanks very much, Shaki. Thank you. Now that we've heard from, um, from Darman, from Michael, uh, from Jan and from Karen, uh, I'd like to open this up for any questions or comments or discussion from the floor. I know that it's 6.25, but believe me, you will still get your drinks and nibbles <laughs> after, okay? But trust me. Are there any questions? Um, I think Izzy is coming round with uh, a microphone. Hi, I'm um, Simon Woods, I'm from the UK, and I'm Professor of Bioethics at Newcastle University, and thought they were really brilliant talks. Thank you very much for that and the comments. Um, the thing I'm interested in here is you've talked about um, eugenics and eugenic as a, eugenics as a justification for wholesale murder, but you've also touched on euthanasia. But is it useful to combine those two things? I mean, doesn't doesn't the idea of euthanasia introduce a whole set of um, other issues which are not really those of state-sanctioned murder. I mean, the possibility of um, a, a free choice, for example, mm. the idea of autonomy. I mean, you, 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 
might be committed to the idea that there is no such thing as autonomy and therefore there can be no such thing as uh, voluntary euthanasia because um, there's, there's no, it's not an autonomous action. If, if you take the logical implication of some of the arguments that have been implicit in the presentations. But I just wondered if you had a, a view on whether we should be talking about euthanasia in its contemporary form alongside eugenics in its <laughs> Nazi yeah. form. Um, I guess that's for me. So uh, I think that the first point is that um, in, I think, the literature around the sort of, a, it's the first, I suppose, generation of literature looking at that this historical period, you know, the Nazi period, and its significance for um, medical ethics and, and bioethics, um, the focus had been on the experimentation and, and sort of the things that constitute the Nuremberg Code uh, after the doctor's trial. The problem was that um, there hadn't been up until probably the early 90s any interrogation of what we now call the Krankenmorde. It was always thought, oh yeah, the Nazi euthanasia. So the term, even though it was an inappropriate term, still sort of sat as this tacit precedent for state involvement in the deaths uh, you know, of, of, of individuals. And so the reason to um, situate a conversation around assisted dying in the context of this conversation is to say, well, this had been a default and I would say lazy um, comparison as a historical example. This is where it goes wrong. See, this is what happened when the Nazis did it. And the reason I was arguing that we need to take a more sophisticated approach beyond God winning um, is that um, firstly that there is a category error. The, the, sort of the Nazi euthanasia program was a program of state sponsored and modern mass murder in the way that the Holocaust, the Shoah, the Parajmas and other groups were. <clears throat> but the, there is, um, in a sort of a deeper consideration, um, a common dilemma, which is the relative valuation of life, um, which is almost a pre-theoretical position taken on questions of um, right to life and right to death. Um, so to say that there is a category of person um, whose existence is lesser valued than others, and in times of um, extremity in history, those individuals are judged to be uh, in states of exception, the bare life that Agamemnon talks about, whether it's the prevention of the birth of these people or the removal of these people through assisted dying, if you will. Um, I think that there is um, some common ground that we have to interrogate, and it's these are tacit assumptions about um, a relative value of life. Uh, and I think that is particularly um, the case when we are looking at the anxiety felt by people living with disabilities in the prospect of you know, uh, legislated assisted dying because whilst it's a very poor historical precedent, there is still um, a principle of a relative valuation of life that needs to be constantly borne in mind uh, because the lived experience is that these laws are implemented with the best intentions um, and are you know, often implemented in very stable political and economic times, um, but history has indicated that at times of extremity, this relative valuation of life comes into play in the assertion of the state over you know, the, the power over life. So that would be my swing at that one. Dharma or Jan, do you, either of you want to comment on that? Jan? Okay. Yes, I can just uh, make a one minor comment. Uh, I, I personally believe that uh, although we, we as, as, as historians we use the term euthanasia campaign, uh, it just, it's something that you use because it's commonly used. I often try to emphasize its so-called euthanasia campaign because uh, it obviously euthanasia is the mercy death as voluntary assisted dying is not what the Nazis were doing during the Second World War. It was connected with the ideological vision of, of the folk for, with economic means, with the war, but certainly not with the benefit for incur incurably sick uh, people. And uh, it's a kind of interesting, the, the film that Michael mentioned, uh, Ich Klage An, uh, I Accuse, um, it tries to present uh, the argument that this is voluntary dying, that uh, the person is, uh, is, is uh, incurably sick with multiple sclerosis, uh, and her husband, doctor, just uh, releases her from her suffering uh, because she doesn't want to live anymore. And even at that time in Nazi Germany, people realized that even in even in Nazi Germany, people realized that this is not what's happening. 
this is kind of story about about uh, some romantic melodrama about a dying person, but what's happening in reality is the killing of disabled. So even at, even in Nazi Germany, people were able to kind of make difference uh, distance between those two presentations. Um, I think we're going to have to draw the afternoon to a close. Um, I'm sorry about that. I'd like to thank um, all of our speakers and panelists. Um, but I'd encourage you to continue or help us continue the conversation around these topics by attending um, the, the subsequent webinars. Uh, I'm sorry that those of you online can't now join us um, for our um, Strength and Nimbles, where we can continue the conversation uh, in person. Um, Damon is too far away, and Jan, I know, is, is off uh, uh, on a voyage quite soon, so we wish you all the best um, in that. Thank you. And, and can uh, we thank our participants in the traditional way and then reconvene outside?